Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, uh, I'm, Elizabeth. <laughs> I'm Elizabeth with the Office of the State Archaeologist, and I'm joined by Cherie Hari Arts. Uh, hopefully, you're watching us on YouTube Live. Just a disclosure, this is the first time we've ever done this. So it's experimental. And thank you to Cherie for, for rolling with me to, to figure this out. Uh, we're going to talk about lithic snipe chipstone tools with a focus on Van Buren County. And it will be a conversational program. So I'll be asking some questions to sort of move us through an outline. And Cherie, as always, is a walking encyclopedia. Uh, so she is going to dive deeper into some of these questions. So we have a, a slideshow. You'll be able to see us and the slideshow at the same time. We'll just add that in here. And if you um, if you would like the live auto captions, there's instructions there. They're also in the YouTube comments. So we're just going to start off with some acknowledgments. Uh, thank you to Jefferson County Conservation for asking us to do this program and for helping to organize it. And it's funded by the DNR Water Trails program. So thank you so much to the DNR. And I also just want to acknowledge that we are interpreting the archaeological past of people who are I am not a direct descendant of. And so I'm I'm looking at this um, this story through through my own lens. And I know Cherie has some acknowledgments as well. Well, um, when you see, the, see the, the, the names the name. that you see on the slides here are, um, are the tribes, tribal nations that have been involved with the state of Iowa one way or another um, back um, time immemorial, way back thousands of years. Uh, and it's our responsibility to acknowledge that this was their land and the uh, process from which they, they lost the land was through a series of treaties and uh, disenfranchisement, uh, which is something that we all need to be aware of at all times. Um, so from an educational point of view, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone will be uh, recognize the number of Native American nations that have been here and their important story that they have to tell of their history and their culture here. Thank you, Cherie. So what are we, what are we talking about? What are we even here for? Um, we're going to talk about some of the basics of chipstone tool technology. So chipstone tools are um, well, they're, they're types of objects that Cherie is going to go more into depth in. But something we, we frequently asked is that when we're out looking for archaeological sites or looking for objects, how do we even know what to look for? And we get a lot of photos from people, uh, members of the public who are asking us to identify stuff. So we'll just, um, I'm just going to ask Cherie, how, how do we know? Well, the first thing you have to look for is the right material type. Chipstone tools are made with uh, a kind of uh, stone that has high silica content. Uh, most common in Iowa is chert, which is forms in limestone, but we also see obsidian, which is natural glass, or Knife River Flint, which is silicified peat moss. Uh, all of these things have high con uh, silica content. Uh, but then we have to look for uh, evidence of human modification. And that is uh, the intention of patterning. Uh, so one single piece of rock can tumble down a hillside and uh, run into something and a flake, like you see here, would be knocked off. Um, one flake could be an accident, but when you start to see patterns or you see multiple flakes, um, then you begin to get the idea that, that human beings were here. So you have to look for um, the evidence of, of intentional uh, flaking debris. So you can see um, that the platform was prepared, um, intentionally done, a striking platform was created, um, and the straight state flake was struck off 
Um, you'll find a core with lots and lots of uh, flakes removed from it. It's like an apple core with bites taken off all around. But these things are simple, systematically produced, and you can see um, the evidence of human production. Uh, over here on the non-cultural side of this slide, you see a lot of things that um, we call fakers or imitations, things that look like they might have been created by humans, but were not. Um, so if you see things like um, the little dimples and uh, things that are worn in wa by water into limestone, uh, these things could look like, you know, people say it looks like just a thumbprint or it looks like something that you could handle it. Um, but we will look for evidence of use wear on this. Um, Somebody might, if they'd used it for a grindstone, there will be marks inside that show the, uh, the grinding marks of the use wear involved inside. Whereas if it's just a natural formation, you would only see the, um, the fact that the water has worn it, the edges will be rounded, there won't be uh, use wear inside it. Right, so there are a lot of pieces of stone out there that are probably the right material or uh, the same material that indigenous people used in their stone tool technology. Uh, but it could be broken by a plow or uh, banged around in some rocks in the water. And honestly, when we recognize this stuff while we're doing field work, it's just because of repetition, we've seen it, we've seen it up close uh, and our brains start to recognize those patterns. And when you find one, you immediately start to look around for more. And when you start to see the pattern, more than one flake, uh, more than one core, you begin to recognize the hand of human beings involved. Oh, yeah. And the, the slideshow now is um, has some arrows pointing to some of those um, common attributes that we see on a flake. And the obsidian shows it really well. So we're talking about non-diagnostic artifacts now, starting with the most basic. Uh, so Cherie, can you explain what non-diagnostic means and what, what are we looking at? Well, a diagnostic tool would give us a little clue as to the time period it was used or the culture group that was using it. Um, and this is done just like looking at styles of cars or styles of shoes, you can begin to say, oh, that's a 1960s Volkswagen cursed to a 1990s Volkswagen. Uh, we can look at different kinds of uh, shapes of spear points or pattern tools and, and have that information just be from years and years of, of uh, archaeological research. But there are thousands and thousands of things like these items here, which are just flakes. Um, Flakes are the sharpest tool. When you strike it off a core, it has a really sharp edge and somebody could pick it up and use it for whatever cutting tasks they needed. Um, it won't last long, it'll get dull very fast and then they could just throw it away because there isn't a lot of time and energy invested in creating it. So we call them utilized flakes, but they don't give us a clue to the time period or the culture group that might've been using them. And what are some of the things that they were used for? We've got oh, a picture here. Quick, especially cutting things like fiber or leather. Uh, if you were um, processing, making something out of string and you need to cut your string or uh, slice a piece of fiber, or perhaps if you're working on basketry or something like that and you need to uh, cut the raw materials that you're working with, those flakes would be perfect for that. Um, and they're, they're super sharp, but they make a nice clean cut. And then when it's dull, then you just drop it. Uh, archaeologists will recognize the, the nibbling and dent, uh, along the edges that, that demonstrate that they were used. Uh, but you know, they're use them and throw them away tools. Right. And one of the, the points that we want to make is that uh, when a lot of people think of archaeology, they think of arrowheads and really the the variety and the types and uses of stone tools go so far beyond what just an arrow point is. So knives. Uh, yeah, a lot of the things that, that look like they might be an arrowhead or a spear point, um, except they're large. And you can't, if you think about it, you couldn't imagine it being on the end of a projectile that was actually flying through the air. It would 
fly about three feet before it crashed to the ground. Um, but these things are uh, probably hafted knives like you see in this picture. These are, are replicas that were made by a colleague uh, to demonstrate how these knives were made. Because remember, once you've killed an animal, uh, with your arrow or your spear, you still have an awful lot of work to do. It has to be butchered. It has to be, uh, the meat has to be cut up. The hide has to be removed and processed. So these knives would have been a very important uh, thing. Probably everybody carried a knife, just like we get used to carrying a jackknife around in our pocket. Okay, we have um, objects that archaeologists call bifaces and then also some unifaces. So a biface is simply something that's worked on both sides, two faces. Um, a uniface is a tool then that was only worked on one side or is minimally worked on the other side. Uh, so usually um, the features of a flake that we saw way back in the very first slide where you see a bolt of percussion and the ripples on it that are a result of the impact of uh, flint napping, um, those still appear on the unifacial tool. One side has been modified and shaped, but the other side, you can still see that bulb of percussion. You can see those ripple marks and things like that. On a biface, both sides have been worked. So those flaking features have been removed. You don't see the bulb or the ripple marks anymore. They've all been modified by uh, continued work on the tool. And I know that most of the objects that we're talking about are bifacial, meaning that they were worked on both sides, but they're not exactly a biface. Um, what do we know about how people used bifaces, if it's just an object like we see here? Well, um, oftentimes those are referred to as preforms. That is um, minimally worked. It's been basically shaped. Um, and a good flint napper could turn that into anything he needed at the time. Um, he would carry a bunch of these preforms, partially made tools. He could turn it into a spear point. He could turn it into a knife or whatever tool he needed at the time with a minimum amount of additional work. Um, this was a, a good advantage for people because you wouldn't want to start from a raw material and start working it when you needed a knife right now. Um, you would have, uh, you might find that there are flaws in the chert, you'd get halfway done and the thing would crack apart or um, there'd be fossils that would uh, impede your working on it. Um, so to have a biface like this, um, it's worked, it's um, in good condition. The, the maker knows exactly what he's got here. And he knows that with a few strokes of his uh, flint napping tools, he could change that into whatever he needs without having uh, a failure in the middle of his project. Right, so it's a good head start. Uh, it's more portable than a big chunk of, of rock Absolutely. that you're carrying around. Mm -hmm. It likely could turn into something that is diagnostic, but in a, the form of a biface, we typically can't date it unless it's found in context with other datable objects. Uh, and it's also fun to note that, that bifaces were stored in cash pits. So sometimes we do find cash pits with just bifaces in them. The scrapers. So scrapers are most often unifacial tools. Um, they have a, a steep, uh, this is a really nice picture of this one up here in the corner. You can see the steeply worked surface on the front here. It would be hafted. Uh, well, some of them were actually handheld, but most often they were probably tied to a handle, uh, a knife, uh, a bone or antler or something like that. And they were used for processing hides. You have to prepare the hide, you have to scrape off the, the hair and the goo on the inside, the muscles and fat and things like that, um, and process it, tan it, and to produce uh, leather or usable rawhide or, or uh, tanned material. Yeah, the, the top one, I love that example. It really shows um, a lot of scrapers might have sort of a perpendicular <laughs> Uh, face on it. And so that 90 degree uh, working or that perpendicular angle is pretty um, iconic of a scraper. And I've found scrapers as small as my thumb, so probably wouldn't be hafted, but they get quite large too. And we do have a hafted example here. 
Uh, so you see somebody is scraping a hide. And then we have um, Bill Quackenbush, the Ho-Chunk Nation and Tribal Historic Preservation Officer did a flute making workshop for us a couple of years ago. And he carried a little scraper of his own around and he's hollowing out the center of his flute here. So uh, scraping both wood, hide, plants. Anything else? Those are probably the primary things. Um, you have other kinds of sharp edge tools that could also be used, things like drills and adzes and things like that. Um, and the variety, as, as Elizabeth said, they can come from large to all the way down to little tiny things called thumbnail scrapers. And those were all probably various stages of production. They each one had their own specific use um, and would have been processed, you know, just like you might have a selection of screwdrivers or something like that, each one with a slightly different use for a different task. And I did find out today because I called up Veronica Mraz, who is our lithic technology specialist at the office of the state archeologist. And she's out busy doing field work, although uh, she might join us by voice later on in the program. And she, I let her know about this, this photo of the hafted. This is a replica scraper that's made out of obsidian. And she said that obsidian actually is definitely not an ideal material type for use in scrapers because it has a very sharp edge but that sharp edge can often puncture or poke through what you're trying to scrape, especially if it's a hide. And also obsidian dull is pretty easy. So this is the kind of knowledge that experimental archeologists have that I just, I don't. There's, a, there's actually an interesting story behind this particular replica one. Uh, it was originally made as a hafted knife um, to demonstrate what a hafted knife looked like and it got dropped and broken. <laughs> so the flint napper, as a true flint napper would, and, and undoubtedly indigenous people also did, picked it up and resharpened it into uh, a scraper. So even though it's probably not the ideal tool, uh, recycling uh, your raw materials, yeah. and saving yourself a lot of work. <laughs> Use what you off. have. Okay, drills. Drills are so cool. Again, like the scrapers, they come in all different shapes and sizes. Um, they were used undoubtedly for working bone. Uh, we have lots of drilled bone. We have flutes. We have things like um, bear canines or bear claws that were drilled to be um, hung as yeah, ornaments. Examples. Um, right, so you can see that the, the drilled bear a uh, canine tooth there. Um, that flute down at the bottom is made on a bird bone. Um, it was naturally hollow, but the flute holes had to be drawn. Um, if Can we back up to this the uh, yeah. slide before? These little teeny tiny scrapers down here at the bottom, these things are a centimeter long. Um, and they were found by the uh, handfuls at a site called Blood Run. And one of the other things they found at Blood Run were lots and lots of de debris from making pipes out of uh, pipe stone or catlinite. Um, and so these little tiny scrapers were probably what was used to drill the hole through the scraper or through the pipe and into the, the pipe bowl. So these were very small. Um, to, and you've gone to the next one, you can see a picture of the pipe on the next side. So this hole had to be drilled and the whole thing had to be drilled out. And that would have been the role for those little teeny tiny scrapers. But if you're processing an, an animal hide um, and you want to perforate it for sewing or something like that, you would use one of the larger size scrapers. So wood and bone and hide, um, all these things were processed with those chipstone uh, drilled and we also have a tool called gravers, um, sort of similar to a drill, but not quite. So you can see what it looks like here. And then we have some examples of what they're using gravers for. So Shuri, do you want to describe sort of what the tool looks like? And then we'll go back to the yeah. things that you can do with a graver. This one is a very formal one. And this picture with the, the actual little point has been worked and chipped. Very often you see them, um, a natural flake would sort of have a tapered edge or something and it would take a minimal amount of work to make this nice little tip point. Um, I think of gravers as more uh, cutting and gouging tools where a drill is making a round hole. 
So in, in the illustration you see on the side, somebody is gouging a groove out of the center of a piece of bone. Uh, this was a way that they made fish hooks. Um, um, and also you see these bone beads. These are my favorites. They're, they're evidences of failures where something didn't work quite right. And that gives archeologists a good clue as to what they were trying to do. Uh, when you see a complete bead, it's rounded and polished and perfect and beautiful and you can't see how they made it. But when you see one that broke like this, they'd made a grooved line around the outside of the bone and it was supposed to snap, break on the dotted line. And for some reason, the groove wasn't deep enough or something snapped it too hard. Um, it, it was a failure. It was probably thrown away. And it's like, oh darn, that one didn't work. And so we see antlers and animal bones, um, teeth sometimes that all have these this groove and snap technique that we call it. Um, we also have here is a split bone awl. This was a limb bone from a deer um, and it's been split longwise. And that would have also been done with a graver. They would have created the groove down both sides and then probably wedged something in there to, to split it in half. Um, so that's the kind of thing that a graver is used for. It can also be used to make very fine, tiny incised lines. So besides something very basic like uh, groove and snap technology, it could be used to make beautiful and probably sacred artwork uh, like the pipestone tablets that we find at some sites, especially in Northwestern Iowa or rock art. Uh, so think of holding a pen or a stylus and using the sharp point on, on the tool to create a picture. Right, and as you mentioned, this one is pretty formal, but we see a lot of flakes or unifacial tools that definitely could be used as gravers uh, for some more, for some quicker tasks. Yeah, or just a minimum amount of modification to, to make the point sturdy so that it didn't snap off, you know, a few flakes here and there and they had one ready to go. As I mentioned, when we started the program, a lot of people will uh, show us objects, send us pictures, or uh, when we're at in-person events, they'll bring up what they're doing. And even when we did Zoom programs with kids, they would show us what they found and say, look, I found this arrowhead. So we're gonna talk a little bit about why that is a misnomer. Yeah. It's one of those words like like brand names that have, have got fallen into, that we call everything an arrowhead. Right. But the accurate term would probably be a projectile point because a projectile could be everything from a thrown spear or an atlatl dart or an arrow. So all three of those tools. Um, but as you say, um, a large Clovis point or one of those early paleo Indian points on the end of an arrow um, would be a really bad arrow. It wouldn't fly through the air. So an actual arrow point is usually quite small. Uh, only a centimeter or two long. Right, uh, and so we've we've now moved from our non-diagnostic tools, so tools that can be found in almost any time period in the past. Spear points, darts, and arrows are diagnostic. So we do have part of our Iowa archaeology timeline up here. Uh, Cherie, if you want to just explain how we know if something is a spear point versus an arrowhead and how that relates to time. Oh, well, the earliest, um, best way to explain this, we look for the other things that are associated with it. Um, so- um, Right, because we, we can't date stone. Right, but if we find um, certain kinds of points stuck in the bones of say a mammoth or a mastodon or something like that, uh, we know then what time period that's associated with. Those are animals that are ice age animals. We know when they became extinct. Um, so this is direct evidence that somebody was hunting those and we can take that style of point and say, this is an ice age point. And it's got to be at least 10,000 years or older because that's when and mammoths went extinct. Uh, so the associations with that, um, we can also date things. We can date stratigraphy in the soil. We can look at um, how those strata were formed and whether they're underneath glacial till or on top of glacial till and things like that, or direct dating with radiocarbon dates. If there's something 
uh, associated with those points um, that we can get a radiocarbon date for. Um, we began to develop a catalog of what kinds of points are associated with what dates and time periods or what kinds of stratigraphic associations. So when we find them later on, we say, oh, this is uh, a Clovis point and we know that it's from the Paleo-Indian period. Um, when right, because we we're, we're comparing it to something that was found in context with something that was datable. Although sometimes it's really tricky to identify a point type. And sometimes they're very similar one to another or um, things have got found and reused. Um, but then as time went on, the, the Paleo-Indian people used both handheld spears and probably adlatl darts. Um, so through um, our knowledge and associations with those and also some experimentation, uh, we could begin to determine uh, what kinds of weapons those things would be best suited for. So about between 2000 and 3000 years ago is when the bow and arrow first appears in Iowa. And um, then we see a very distinctive change in the style of projectile points. Um, they become very small, uh, something that, that would be aerodynamically sound uh, attached to an arrow. Right, and so they really embraced bow and arrow technology full on, pretty much all but dropped the spears, stopped or dropped using spear point technology. And um, yeah, it's interesting because there is a period of overlap mm -hmm. uh, where atlatl darts and the bow and arrow seem to occur together. Um, talking to um, Dr. Whitaker at, at Grinnell College, one of the things he suggests is that. Um, the first bows might not have been very good. <laughs> it took a while for that technology to get, uh, you know, to develop the technology for making a backed bow and things like that. Um, and also you have your conservative people who are like, I'm going to do it the way I've always done it and the way my dad did it and the way my grandfather did it. Right. It's a new skill. <laughs> also, um, there are some advantages to an atlatl uh, over a bow. Uh, you can do it with one hand. Uh, you can make an atlatl in five minutes out in the woods. All it takes is a forked stick. Uh, you cut off one fork, you have an atlatl. Uh, mm -hmm. Whereas creating a backed bow is days and days of work and steaming and applying glue and things like that. Um, children, old people, I mean, I've had kids as young as four throwing darts with atlatls. Um, you can have old people do it. It doesn't take, you know, when you think of a bow and you talk about the 45 pound draw, how, the amount of force it takes to pull that bow to its maximum, um, that takes a person with some muscle and some strength uh, to do that. Whereas an atlatl doesn't require that kind of basic strength in order to use the, the tool. So for a while, they seem to go side by side and then the, gradually the atlatl darts drop out and the bow technology uh, takes over. Yeah, so we'll talk about spear points a little bit. So the, the earliest evidence we have of people coming into what is now known as Iowa are Clovis points in that um, they, they roughly date to 10 to 12,000 years ago. And I think we, we usually say it's about 13,000 years ago that we have evidence um, from the archeological perspective of people being in Iowa. And stone of course is inorganic, so it doesn't break down over time. So a lot of the material culture evidence from that time period has decayed and disintegrated. It's very hard to find, but we do have these spear points if you want to talk more about the types that we see here. Uh, yeah, the earliest ones, the, the classic um, thing is you can see these uh, flute, this basic uh, flake scar removed from the very base of the tool. Yeah, and, and they're highlighted in some of the photos. And a couple of them, you can see them outlined in yellow because it's, it's really hard to get them to show up in a photograph. Um, but that basal flute that's called um, was a hafting technique. So you could fit it in a slot on, on a, a wooden haft um, without it splitting apart your haft. Um, 
So these are, um, this is the diagnostic evidence for these Clovis points. And then when you get to the Folsom point, uh, the flute is much larger. It actually takes up almost all of the surface on both sides. Um, so these are the earliest points. And then the Paleo-Indian period takes off. Um, and in the later time periods, you get a lot of different uh, styles of points such as these. Um, there's distinctive uh, flaking pattern to Paleo-Indian tools. Um, if you look at these two, the Hell Gap point and the Agate Basin point across the bottom, you'll see that the flake scars on there are all pretty much uniform size. Um, they're all perpendicular to the long axis of the tool. And most of the scars run at least to the center point, if not beyond. Um, and these seem to be classic characteristics of Paleo-Indian flint napping. These were highly skilled uh, flint nappers. And the uniformity of these flake scars and the length of those tiny thin flakes um, if you've ever tried to do it yourself, you really admire the amount of uh, skill that these uh, demonstrate. And we have this example here that you included. Yeah, that's because this one really does show up how uniform all these flake scars are and how they're all perfectly perpendicular to the long axis of the, of the tool. Uh, that one is shinier. So the flake yeah. scars show up a little bit better in the photograph. And these are true arrowheads. And if you look at the scale on there, that's a centimeter long. Uh, so some of these tiny little Cahokia points here um, are, are a centimeter slightly more than a centimeter long. So very, very small. Um, they could get slightly larger. This one's maybe two centimeters long, but very much smaller than those big ones. And this is a replica um, to just give you an idea of how all these notches and stems and things would have been attached to the, the wooden shaft for the arrow. But if you think aerodynamics, then uh, you get some good information about how much, how well one of those would fly through the air. And then we have some examples of objects that were spear points at one time, but no longer. They took on a second life. And this is just like that, that replica scraper that we have. It was broken. It was resharpened. It didn't even have to be taken off of the, the handle, uh, which is a lot of work. But here we have a Dalton point um, from the late Paleo-Indian period and the early Archaic period. Um, and here's another one. The base of it, the bottom half, is exactly the same. And it's associated with the same uh, stratigraphic context, um, but it's been changed. Uh, so somehow it was broken and reworked and turned into a drill. Um, here is another uh, point. Uh, and again, this one, just exactly like my replica, obsidian replica, uh, the tip broke off and it was recycled and turned into a scraping tool. Um, no sense making more work for yourself than you have to. Um, everybody is aware of that. <laughs> right, and if it's, if it's there and you can use it, you might as well use it. Um, to go out and obtain more chert and to reduce it from a core down to something that you could use, that would be a time consuming task. So go ahead and use what you've got. <laughs> so we're gonna talk a little bit about flint napping because I want people to get an idea of um, what we know about stone tool technology. And the fact is, is that archeologists do a lot of experimentation themselves to learn about this. So we have a few slides on the flint napping process that Cherie will talk us through. <laughs> and so you see on, on the left here, you see um, a piece of glass. Um, and you may be familiar if you remember the days before safety glass and automobile windows, uh, where a pebble could fly off off of a road and hit your windshield and it would, a little cone would pop out the bottom, the backside. Um, and that's exactly what's demonstrated here. This is some grass that was shot with a BB. And the side that it's shot with, there's a small hole, but on the opposite side, a cone forms. 
Uh, and this is what's called conchoidal fracture. The physicists call it a Hertzian cone of percussion, if you want the fancy term for it. Um, but this is classic conchoidal fracture. And this is what uh, uh, prehistoric flint nappers took advantage of, was this particular circular way that um, the certain kinds of rock that have a high silica content. And of course, glass is has a high silica content. Uh, so, um, so does all the, the materials, the stone tools that they used for flint napping. So what they did was, if you strike it here, the force travels away in opposite directions and creates that cone that pops out. Uh, flint nappers learned to take advantage of this um, they didn't want a whole cone, but if they struck something right on the edge, um, they would get part of that cone would come off and that's your flake. Um, so what you're seeing here is you can still pick out the point of percussion and you can see the direction of the force that traveled through that flake. And um, it tapers from the thick edge to a very thin, sharp pointed edge. Um, this is because silica rocks with high silica content, it actually responds as if it were a liquid. So if you think of throwing a rock into a pond, you'll get a big splash, and then you'll see the ripples flow away in, in concentric circles around from where that rock went in. Um, the exact same thing is going on when you strike the rock, you'll get a bulb of percussion, a big bulge. That's the splash and then the ripples go flowing away in concentric circles away from it. That's conchoidal fracture. Um, so if you learn to control how that force flows through the rock, you can make all kinds of really beautiful stone tools. Right, and not only learning how to control that force, but the, the in-depth knowledge that indigenous people had about the types of rocks to use and what how those rocks would um, respond to to this is it's really amazing and they could adapt with a lower quality rock and they could also um, go for those more coveted high quality high silica rocks both from local sources and from training yes. so right yeah. we start with a really big chunk of rock that's and called the what? core um and so this is where um you see, here's that whole Hertzian cone, but all they're really taking off is this piece, this little flake right here. Um, and so that's, if you prepare your core right, um, you can go around and around and around and take off lots and lots and lots of flakes from your core. Um, they will get smaller as your core gets smaller, but then they would all have various different kinds of uses from it. Uh, you could just take a raw material and, and whack off one big flake if that's all you need, but a well-prepared core will generate hundreds of flakes. Um, right, so a pretty innovative understanding of physics. And the hard hammer percussion with uh, a hammer stone or sometimes a big antler billet is really the, the first step in that, that reduction to get your, your core or your, your chunk of raw material down to something that you want to shape into another tool. And then when you've got your basic shape down and you want to refine it, um, turn it into that final spear point or arrowhead or drill or something, um, that would be done with uh, percussion flake or uh, uh, flaking, where you take a tool like an antler or a piece of pointed bone and you actually do pressure flaking along the edge and remove, you're removing now tiny flakes like those we saw on that uh, agate basin point or the hell gap point. Um, and this is uh, tiny, tiny refined flaking that you can use to shape your tool, make the little notches that you saw on those tiny little arrowheads, um, things like that. That's all done with pressure flaking. So, Archaeologists have an understanding of what stone tools are and um, what their function are. But what I think is is pretty great about new technology that lithic analysts are using is that we're really changing our interpretation of a lot of what stone tools functioned for, and even even flipping some things on their head. So. 
um, use wear analyses. We use high powered microscopes to do use wear analysis. Um, Sheree, do you wanna expand on this at all? Um, yeah, this is Melody Pope, who, who used to work at our office. She's in Indiana now, but her research focused on uh, use wear. Uh, so she developed her skills. She became a flint napper. She created tools and then she used them for very specific tasks, such as in this picture here, she's scraping a hide. She also then used others to cut, uh, cut grasses, to drill, drill through bone, uh, drill through stone, um, and then using microscopic analysis, using scanning electron microscopes, very fine, she's uh, able to identify different kinds of wear that shows up. So you can determine that um, the kind of wear, this was done to drill shell, this was done to drill bone. It comes out looking very different. And F by doing experiments, um, uh, micro or use wear analysts can can determine um, what those raw materials was. So this one was this one is drill polish from drilling bone. This one is drill polish from drilling shells. Um, that it's it's fascinating that um, as because as you cut into something, you're actually um, depending on how hard it is or uh, you might actually get coatings of things. Grass contains silica in the, in the stems of the plant. So when you're cutting any kind of a grass, which includes corn and wheat and uh, domestic crops, um, you're actually coating the edge of your cutting tool with the silica um, contained in the stems of the plants. And this becomes a highly polished rounded sheen. Um, so through experiment, experimentation, uh, we're beginning to get uh, some really interesting detailed work of trying to determine what some of these tools were used for. Right. And you have to have that experimentation in order to make the comparisons with what you're seeing on tools from the past. And so there, um, these archaeologists are basically making a, a catalog of the, the patterns that they're seeing. So they even distinguish, Veronica tells me, between polish and gloss. So when you harvest grains, it will look more glossy rather than a polish. And that's not something I understand, but I think it's pretty cool. And you can also tell um, sort of the physics of the activity. And so if you saw something back and forth rather than make a, a cut in one direction, those patterns also show up through use wear analysis. Um, but the limitations of it are that with these high powered microscopes, you are zooming into a very small part of that stone tool to get a picture. So you're looking at you're looking at one part of it and you can look at more parts. It just takes a lot of time. So it's pretty time consuming, but it gives us really wonderful interpretations of what these tools were used for. And in fact, it's it's sort of showing us um, use wear analyses and also residue analysis. We don't have any photos of that but archaeologists can also analyze the residues on stone points. So we no longer, you know, throw them all in the wash basin like we used to and, <laughs> and scrub them off with toothbrushes because they contain traces of residue that give us some, some hints into what they were using it for. And it, it turns out that even an arrowhead, but certainly spear points, might not just have been a spear point. They were sort of the Swiss army knife. You would pick up the same tool and you know you could cut some meat and then you'd cut the plant next to you and so you the same tool might have been used to process animals for plants fish bird feathers uh, and all of these all of these things make different patterns and leave different residues so through this analysis um, we're getting a, a pretty broad picture of this technology it's also giving us clues to uh, prehistoric use of items that we'll never find in the archaeological record. You're never going to find bird feathers. The odds of, of a bird right. feather being preserved um, are, are very, very slim in a place like Iowa. Uh, but the wear on it, uh, on a point suggesting that it might have been used to cut bird feathers with, gives you a clue. Uh -huh. uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. <laughs> So now we'll show some examples from Van Buren County. And um, as 
Cherie and I both looked through the archives. Uh, there are a lot of archaeological sites in Van Buren County. There's um, probably close to 900, if not more. And we've done a lot of work in Van Buren County, Cherie and I, as education staff. And but we usually focus. We focused on almost every time period, but not as much um, the very early indigenous cultures. Uh, you have Bonaparte Pottery. You have Iowaville, which is a historic Indian village. There are just there's some uh, great historic sites that we've been to, but we don't interpret a lot of the the prehistoric past. And when I was looking through our archives, I realized that we don't have a lot of photographic records of chipstone tools in Van Buren County. We do have some, but that. Um, kind of gives me the hint that a lot of what's found in Van Buren County is probably found by private collectors. And some of them have shared their finds with us and shared their photos with us. Uh, also, OSA personally hasn't done a whole lot of archeological work in Van Buren County. Um, the Iowaville project is an exception and Bonaparte pottery, but on those prehistoric sites where we would find a lot of chipstone tool technology. And so there are other archeological companies doing that work, but also it just goes to show that, uh, it, well, it's a rural county. And if if there's not as much development in as many projects, um, you don't need archeologists to go in and do that work. Um, so this one is, it was given a site number. So this is from a private collection and the photo was taken in 1962. And uh, it has a site number, which means the, the property owner, the person who found them, kept a record of where he found them. So we can at least tie the location of this to a farm or somebody's property. And what caught my attention of this one in the archives was that there's the base of a Clovis point here. So this is showing that uh, our earliest known artifacts in Iowa have definitely been found in Van Buren County. And, and it looks like look at the time range because we go from the projectile point to the little arrow point there in the bottom row in the middle. Um, so there is a, a wide range of time represented by this very small collection. Yeah. And the circular item, it's hard to tell from a photograph, but it's it's probably some sort of scraper, I would guess. Yeah, and probably the one in the upper left hand corner looks like yeah. a scraper too. Um, another older picture, this one uh, does not have any context so that that means we don't have a record of where it was found. And this one also jumped out at me because it looks like what we would po probably call a graver. Okay, one with letter D on it there. Yeah, and it looks like, I'm not sure if C and E, I believe they are lithics, it's hard. To, it almost looks like pottery in a black and white picture. Um, but there's also a lancelet point, which is something typically older in Iowa. And that is the long one labeled A. Uh, this is a, another picture that was taken in the 90s, but it is black and white. And um, again, you have that variety. And there wasn't much in the in the archives for this description, Cherie, but what do you think of A? <laughs> it's, that's what we call a biface. <laughs> it's worked on both sides. Um, I can't tell if that uh, knob sticking off the top was intentional or if it's one of those things that, um, as when we when I told you about the, the beads where you see them cut and broken and it didn't break right and we can tell yeah. uh, what they were thinking. Uh, sometimes you see that in lithics as well. Somebody runs into, there's a fossil or a little pocket of crystals or something and it won't flint nap right. They can't get it to come off and make a nice thin uh, flake and, and thin their biface down. Um, yeah. so sometimes you see mistakes and accidents or maybe the person who made it just didn't need, it didn't need to be a perfect point. It, it had a, a sharp cutting edge on one side and they didn't care that it had that knob sticking right, off the other Right, it possibly end. served its function. And if you look at the scale, the, the full scale is about three inches. So it's, it's kind of a small object. So it, it's possible it was on its way into becoming a spear point or some sort of other tool, but it didn't. If you couldn't get far. it thin enough, he said, I could still use it for a cutting tool. And right. uh, 
used it for that. And then it looks like we have a, a scraper there and probably, um, it's not a an dark, arrowhead, but. Probably a dark point. A yeah. dark point. Um, this one is interesting. It doesn't look like much, but this one is from the site we call Iowaville, which is a historic Iowa village. And of course, um, Iowa is named for the Iowa people. And so they were living in this village about the same time that George Washington was president. And, and so Europeans had been on the continent for several decades at that point and brought metal and brought glass. And so we have a lot of metal artifacts from Iowaville. We have a lot of glass beads. We have a lot of bone tools, uh, but we still have this, this little chipstone tool. And I'm not quite sure what it is, but it it is, uh, it, I mean, it's possible it could have been found at the site and been from an earlier time period, but it also could indicate that transition in the technology and, and the material technology at the time. If I remember from, from the analysis of the bones at Iowaville, there was uh, very conservative about adapting new technologies. Um, so there were certain things that were still done the traditional way. Uh, and that may have been for you know, cultural conservatism, or it might have been a religious purpose, whereas a pot is nice for cooking in, but when it comes to doing you know, something else, we want to do it the old way, the more respectful way, right. or something like that. So they seem to have been uh, kind of conservative culturally with some of their technologies at Iowaville. And, and smart, because like simply this is something that was useful. So why not have it? Uh, this is from a personal collection, and this is a photo that we recently acquired. Uh, so these are not any objects that we've analyzed at the Office of the State Archaeologist, but I love this photo because it it shows you so much. You pretty much have the whole chronology of Iowa's archaeological past in this one photo. Um, is there anything that jumps out at you, Cherie? Well, I see the big lancelet points in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, lots of tiny, tiny little arrow points, uh, especially over on the uh, right-hand side. Um, some things, I don't know, can you see the cursor when I point to things? No. Here's some, <laughs> oh. um, off on the left-hand side, I see some one that looks like it was broken and worked into a drill. Yeah. Um, and another one that snapped in two, I can't tell if it was reworked for a scraper or not. Um, there is really a variety of tools here. And right, I see drills, I see things that were recycled, I see scrapers, I see a little ads, which is a sort of groundstone tool. We didn't cover groundstone tools in this program. Um, I also see a couple of non-cultural objects. If you look on the right-hand side, Cherie. These, oh, uh, yep. Yep, those look like net, they look like little birds' nests. They're, um, those are probably just natural formations. Those are things that um, called potholes. They form in uh, rivers as as water. Uh, small stones go bouncing down the riverbed. They'll get caught in a depression and bounce around and hollow out something like that. Or they could be concretions, which are formed naturally deep in the ocean back when Iowa was underwater. Yeah, and they're, so they're really pretty common geological features. I would estimate that we get photos of similar objects like this um, once every month or two. When and we were up in Hardin County, we saw dozens and dozens of those iron concretions. They must be really common on the Iowa River up around Hardin County. And so I, I threw in some pipe stone. Uh, so th these are not chip stone, what we're covering in this program, but as Cherie mentioned earlier, you use a lot of chip stone technology to create the features that you see on this pipe stone. So these are all from Iowaville as well. Did you wanna elaborate on? Oh, yeah, pipes are uh, an interesting thing. First of all, you had to make a chip stone tool in order to make the pipe. Um, and then, they were probably, the initial piece was carved with a, a sharp knife. Um, you can find pieces that, you know, where it's roughed out, you can see the, the cut marks. Um, the, at Blood Run, they found little things that looked like saws, just, just a few centimeters long. Um, and those were probably used for cutting out the blank shape. 
Um, and a drill would be used to create the holes and, and through the stem. Uh, and then it turns into a ground stone production, which is used by pecking and chipping and polishing using sand lubricated with water to uh, finish, get the final finish, the sheen and the polish on the outside of it. So many different stages of production used to make those pipes. And I um, see some examples that show some of that, that scraping uh, that you were talking about with the gravers and uh, I'm not sure, but I believe a lot of this is from the Blood Run area, which is on the opposite corner of Iowa from Van Buren County. So we're talking Northwest Iowa in Lyon County is where the, the largest known Oneota settlement was that, that, that we know of. And so the people at Iowaville and Blood Run certainly knew of each other and interacted and were, were family. Um, and, when, and oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say so the the Iowa or the Bahoje are descendants of the people who were at Blood Run and Iowaville, and uh, a, something really exciting that's happened for them. So they're now the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and they just um, created their first ever tribal national tribal park which is an archaeological site <laughs> which is the leary site and and so that's um that's just pretty great i think yeah that's really exciting i was just going to point out the top couple of rows of uh things with the the pipe stone in this photograph that's all garbage that's the debris left over from making a pipe the ones in the bottom couple of rows are fragments of finished pipes that lost or broken for some reason um but you know a lot of times collectors like to find the perfect piece or a complete piece but archaeologists really learn a lot from the failures and the fragments the debris that was you know these are the pieces that were cut off and thrown away while creating a pipe um, so we can learn a whole lot about how they made those items by looking at the debris and the various stages of manufacture that we find. Same with chipstone tools as well. A lot of, especially early collectors would take complete spear points, complete knives, complete arrowheads, and they'd leave everything else. Uh, but everything else tells a, a really incredibly rich story about how everything was produced. Oh, and this is an example for, from Jefferson County. And there are much fewer recorded archaeological sites in Jefferson County than in Van Buren County. And what I thought was interesting about this one was just look at how broken everything is. <laughs> it's just so fragmented. And so I wonder if they were been in a in a plowed field where they've had lots of It's possible. So this was not an OSA project, but it it ties into what we were just saying about a lot of collectors will pick up the complete <laughs> The complete tools, but there is there's a lot more to the story, and the site was full of just those little broken off pieces. Uh, there's one looks like one or maybe two complete arrow points there, uh, and everything else is missing something. So we'll go a little bit into artifact collecting, and so if you're watching on YouTube, you can post a comment in the live chat if you have a question. I haven't seen any questions come up so far, and if you don't have any questions, that's fine as well. So we always talk about the do's and don'ts of collecting artifacts in Iowa. Most of Iowa is private property, and if you're that private property owner, it's your property. Um, but if it's public land, such as county lands, uh, state parks, state archaeological preserves, anything that's owned by the public, including schoolyards, uh, it's, it's not legal to collect items from those places. So you do need to know where you're at and you have to have permission from the private property owner. And I would encourage, if you're interested in this, join the Iowa Archaeological Society. It is both advocational and interested members of the public as well as professional archaeologists. Uh, definitely don't collect any human remains. Those are protected under the Iowa burial law. Uh, 
And context is important. So mixing artifacts from different sites and not recording where they came from, really that context is the, the richest piece of information that, that archeologists can get. So the object on its own is a very limited story, but the object in context with everything around it, where it came from, what it's near, that really gives us a rich story of the past. Uh, Sheree, did you wanna add anything about these do's and don'ts? Um, well, I was going to just point out that um, one of the things Elizabeth pointed out earlier was a lot of the information that we have on sites from Van Buren and Jefferson County came from private collectors. Uh, so those people kept good records. Uh, when the archaeologists visited their site, A, they were willing to share, and B, they could tell you where the stuff came from. They didn't trade it. They didn't buy it on the internet. Um, they knew what field it came from, what creek it was associated with. Um, and the archaeologists aren't interested in, in taking those artifacts. They took some photographs. Um, they were able to, to record where those things were found on a map and, and put, enter that information into our site files. So collectors who keep good records and good context um, can be very informative and very useful to our knowledge about uh, Iowa's prehistoric they're, past. They're really critical to our knowledge about Iowa's archeological past. And we don't ever take artifacts and we don't take property. If so if you find an archeological site on your property, you can record it as a site and we will not share that location with anybody else um, except for professional archeologists and I also wanted to add something that's not on this list, but probably should be, is that you know most of Iowa's archaeological past focuses on indigenous people, many of whom still live in Iowa and surrounding states today. And so I would very much encourage people to um, seek out resources created by indigenous people in Iowa and or who have connections to Iowa to learn about their history and their culture from their perspectives. There are a lot of great resources. And one I can think of off the top of my head is Lance Foster's Indians of Iowa book. Any yeah. that you can think of, Sheree? Uh, well, I, there's um, the Meskwaki Culture History Museum. Um, there's an entire museum interpreting the, the, uh, the Meskwaki history and, and culture. Um, that's on the settlement in Tama County. Um, there is also uh, in White Cloud, the IOA have a museum. Um, those are, are great places to visit and uh, learn how people in, inter are interpreting their own culture and their own artifacts. Um, very informative. Um, we do have a question from, from Brittany. So Brittany is wondering who made, who made, who did the flint napping? Probably everybody. Um, it's it's hard to tell, um, but uh, women were the ones who were doing the farming, who were butchering things, who were processing hides, um, who were making uh, baskets and pottery and things like that. So there's, you know, for sure, they knew how to flint nap, how to keep their knives sharp, how to create those things. Um, the men primarily did the hunting. Um, so um, you know, it's it's often associated with, you know, the spear points and the arrow points and things like that. But when you take into consideration all of the different kinds of tools that were made with chipstone, um, there were, uh, those are both men and women's um, children probably learned to flint nap very early on. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that everybody at least had basic knowledge. Yeah. Um. This is just a, a page out of a pamphlet that we have. And if you email me and want a copy of this pamphlet, I'm happy to send it to you. It just gives a little bit of how to's about recording sites, how to take photos and make a map on your phone to show us the location. And again, we don't share that location with anybody else. Uh, so we are happy to take another question or two if interested, otherwise, we can, we can wrap this up and we will make this link public um, once I'm able to edit the closed captions and get that all integrated. Um, Cherie, did you have anything else to add about 
Chipstone mm. tool technology? <laughs> no, I just except to add there's there's a whole nother category of stone tools, which we didn't get to talk about. And that would be ground stone, which are uh, the big heavy things like axes and adzes and manos and metates. Yeah. Uh, thanks and for, we've got a whole hour, over an hour on chipstone tools. Alone. Thanks for grinding and pounding. <laughs> yeah, and again, Jefferson County Conservation organ organized this program and it was sponsored by the DNR Water Trails Program program. It's a new thing for us to do this sort of digital outreach, but there is a pandemic going on. And so we're, we're dedicated to learning this and getting better at it. And we would love to do more programs. Um, and we're happy to work with people on topics. So our, our education program uh, is unfunded. So we do require fees for this, but we welcome any sponsors and you can email us if you'd like to sponsor a program or if there's a topic you'd like to learn about and we'll continue to keep um, scraping up grants and other funding to do some more digital programs as well. So I think, I think I'm good. We have one request for a brochure, so I will send that to Marilyn. Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, this has been fun, a little strange talking to a computer without, you know, a nice smiling <laughs> audience looking back at us and nodding. Um, but yeah. Feel free to contact us if you have questions. Um, yes, you can email osa at uiowa.edu. That's our general email box and uh, the right message will get to either Sheree or myself. <laughs> And uh, you can also follow us on Facebook. That's Iowa Archaeology. I think a lot of you found out about this program for Facebook. Of course, we have a YouTube channel you can subscribe to. So if we are able to do more of these programs and you're a subscriber to our channel, you'll see when we put those up. And uh, if, if you're deep into the so world of social media, we also have a Twitter and Instagram account at Iowa Archaeology. But enjoy. Your evening, I'm getting lots of thank yous are, are popping up. Um, we, as always, we appreciate you showing up for our programs, whether it's in person or not. It means a lot that you support us and that you're interested in this and that you just show up. So absolutely, thank you. Have a good night, all. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>